Okay, let's just start again. So, is it showing there? So we see that we are able actually to divide the spectral the, the spectrum of the signal into uh, different bands and then we can investigate the signal through each of these bands and do the process for each band and it's called subband coding. So for the first type of the filter bank and the types of the, I mean, the um, uh, derivations that we had for the non-distortive and also without any async filter banks. Uh, whatever we talked about was uh, called for the critically dec decimated filter bank, which is actually the, f the one that you can see here. It's called the critically decimated filter bank. So critically decimated filter bank is a type of filter bank which the number of the subbands is equal to the decimation filter that you have here so if you have m channels and here you see that you have m channels and you have the m down sampling rate here is this is actually called the decimation the critically decimated filter bank and we investigated through how we can get a filter bank without aliasing and distortion. We got the results. <coughs> and these were the conditions just for the two case, for the two channel case, but it can be generalized for any number of the channels. And we saw that by mirroring, so by having this extra condition, then we can have a mirror filter bank or quadrature mirror filter bank. It's much simpler. And for the QMF filter bank, you need to just have one filter designed and all the other filters can be easily extracted based on that. So that was called the QMF filter bank. Then in order to solve the problem of distortion, because this distortion will not be completely solved by QMF, even though aliasing is solved. If we go through the orthogonal perfect reconstruction uh, structure for the QMF, which necessitates that we have to make another constraint for the powers, so then we can actually get the filter bank, which is both aliasing free and also without distortion. Then we saw that we can have a half band filter by designing P0. First, then we know that this is the equation that satisfies the condition for uh, having no distortion. So we go for P0, we design this. And then we factorize this to into two different filters, G0 and H0. And for the examples, we saw that we can easily go through half of these filter tabs. And for the rest, they could be easily extracted based on the constraints that we need. So we had this degree of freedom to choose half of the filters based on the condition that we want to, to be met, actually. So then we went through how we can implement the filter banks more efficiently using the polyphase structure and we explained about what polyphase filters are so we saw that if this is the filter and if for example you have three polyphase filters it means that you have to divide this so um, you have to actually superimpose this edge of n by three different filters and then do the downsampling for each of them, what you get is actually the polyphase representation of this H of N. For when, for example, we have three polyphase filters. You can have more, but you have you can generate these uh, more sub 
filters and then create this polyphase corresponding to that. And totally what, I mean, um, the derivation of the polyphase in time domain and the z domain are actually implemented, uh, are derived here. And as an example, uh, with the structure of the polyphase, we made an example for the three branch, for the three channel filter bank. So we use the noble identities for the input part, which is the analysis filter, and the output part, which is the synthesis filter. And using the noble identities, we could actually replace the down sampler with the filter by a small change. And that change actually was changing the filter to this polyphase factor. Then we can easily replace the down sampler or up sampler and the filter. And we got actually the QMF polyphase structure, which is a fast implementation without losing anything about the, I mean, the entire constraints and the conditions and properties of the filter. We can have everything. The only difference is that we can implement it faster. Another type of the filter bank, which is widely used as actually a uniform DFT filter bank. So it's called uniform because of what I explained already that the spectrum is divided into uniform channels, into uniform sub-channels. So the structure is almost the same as the others. Let's go through how it's designed. So for a uniform DFT filter bank, you actually go for a filter, just a low pass filter, which is called H0. And it's called the prototype filter. So what you do is actually you design just a one filter, which is a prototype low pass filter. And the rest of the filters, which span the entire spectrum of the signal, they are all de derived from this prototype filter just based on shifting based on this equation. As an example, so you have one low pass filter designed, we call it H0, and then you just easily shift that in the Z domain or somehow modulation in the, f if you do the modulation, frequency modulation, then you will get that filter over the entire spectrum and the size of the filters, the bandwidth of the all the all the filters should be the same. That's why it's called the uniform DFT filter bank. And that's the equation. So the only thing we need to go through is one prototype filter, which is called H0. And for this prototype filter, you have to design it in this way that, for example, if you have M, M bands, then this cutoff frequency should be P over M and it will repeat on 2 pi. So that's the entire thing that you, you need to go through. You design one filter as a prototype, and then you shift it for the entire band based on the number of the channels that you want, for example, M channels, then you know how to go for the rest of the filters. That's called the uniform DFT filter bank. Again, just like any other filter banks, so we have a design, idea and then we have an implementation idea. For the design, we already saw that decimation, critically decimated filter bank, QMF filter bank, and now uniform DFT filter bank. But again, in implementation, we can have polyphase structure to be faster. So the inefficient way of the uniform DFT filter bank is just to use the H0 as a prototype for the low pass one and then shifting it, shifting it, shifting it until we completely cover the entire spectrum. And then the structure for, I mean, the, the same structure that we had. So using the down sampling. But this, as already we saw, is inefficient. So in order to make it efficient, we need to get through the polyphase components of those filters, which are respectively shown by E0, E1, and the end. So this way and symmetrically for the synthesis part of the filter bank we also have to do the same thing. So 
the same idea for the synthesis part. This uniform DFT filter bank and uh, a very similar other filter bank, which is called cosine modulated filter bank, they both belong to the para unitary filter banks. Which in these filter banks, the para unitary filter banks actually, the sum of the energy of all the sub bands is equal to the energy of the input signal. And also for both of them, so the DFT filter bank and the uh, cosine modulated filter bank, we just need to go for designing one prototype filter. And just by having one prototype filter, we can derive the rest of the filters that we need for them covering the entire spectrum. That's the, the property actually. So they are very, they are pretty much the same. The only difference is that cosine modulated filter bank actually goes for the filters with the real uh, coefficients. So as we had like the Fourier transform and DCT transform, which is, I mean, they are mostly the same. The only difference was that DCT gives us real coefficients, while DFT gives us complex coefficients. And here we have the same idea. So cosine modulated filter banks are actually using the same idea. So they go for one prototype filter, P0, low pass filter. Their cutoff frequency is a bit tighter. So here we had pi over n, but here you have to actually design a more strict filter. The cutoff frequency is actually set on pi over 2n. So it means that your filter should have a very uh, sharper actually transition band than what we had for the DFT filter bank. But to the cost of having real values, while for the DFT filter bank we had actually the complex values. So they are quite the same. The only difference is in the cutoff frequencies. Here we have pi over n, here we have pi over 2n. But they are designed from the same thing and modulating here, modulation based on the cosine or here. Uh, yeah, here we have actually modulation based on the cosine. So the equation is actually here. So we have the P0 and for the K filter, we have actually this P0 of N, the low pass filter, times the, the cosine with these equations. So these are actually, the cosine modulated filter bank is actually um, very efficient. We can find very efficient implementation for cosine modulated filter bank with real value actually in nature. And it could be implemented very fast. So, uh, and also I said that they are belonging to the para unitary filters. And we can, for para unitary filters, we can also uh, try to find orthogonal filters. So we can design these HK values, these HK filters, such that they be orthogonal. When we say orthogonal, it means that part of the information that is extracted out of one filter is completely orthogonal to the one taken out from the other filter. So to have no correlation in case of information. So, So far, we talked about this uniformly, uh, those filters, those filter banks, which uniformly divide the spectrum of the signal. Now, with the same idea that we have for the quantization, uh, you remember that we, when we talked about the quantization, we said that for most of the signals, not all the part of uh, the spectrum is actually, or not, not all the, uh, for example, dynamic range is important. So we try to quantize the signal based on the importance of the information uh, and the part of the dynamic range, which actually, in most cases, essentially contain that information. So we talked about the MULA and ALA standards, and we said that the dynamic range is actually 
compressed using the ALA or MULA standard. Why? Because quantization levels around the offset, they have more information than those in the higher part of the amplitude. So here is for the spectrum is the same. So most of the signals, they have their information scattered non-uniformly in the spectrum. So most of the information belongs to the lower part of the frequency spectrum than the higher parts. So it's not a good idea to have a uniform, uniformly divided spectrum. It's better to have the division, which has more localized in the frequency, the lower frequency, but then having a wider localization uh, of the spectrum in the higher frequencies. This way we can get more information out of the signal. And while we are reconstructing the signal, then it would be much closer to what we actually need. That's why non-uniform filter banks actually came up. So for non-uniform filter banks, for example, as it's shown here, what we have is that we go for a low pass filter, which is actually very tight. We see that it's very sharp and very, uh, so very low pass, like H0. And it's, for example, the cutoff frequency is set on pi over eight for the ch eight channel. And then we have a high pass right to next to that. And then we try to make it looser and looser and red. So the condition is starting to be relaxed. When we are going to the high pass filters, it is starting to be more relaxed. But for the low pass, we have the divisions more uh, precise. These are called the non-uniform filters. And how we can implement such kind of filter banks, non-uniform filter banks, it's so simple. So one of the ideas is the two channel filter bank idea. So we get the signal, we divide it by the low pass and the high pass. So like this, we have the spectrum, then we divide it by the low pass and the high pass. But then we again take the low pass part and we add the same structure, just like the lattice structure. We add the same structure to the low pass version, low pass version of the signal. And then we go ahead until we finalizing, you know, with the um, the localization in the spectrum as we want. So. The first division and then for the low pass version again it goes for the two cases then continues for example here for three steps so for this kind of non-uniform uh, filter banks is just like to say we have a high pass filter and then the for example, here, if it's called H3, then it's a high pass filter H3, just like here, the first one. Then H2 would be the previous one, the H3, times the low pass filter. So you had the low pass filter here. The, H, the high pass filter, by adding, so by, by zero padding, the high pass filter. So you, between adding two samples of the high pass filter, you just put one zero. By doing that, so somehow like in the upsampling. So by upsampling this one, and then times the low pass filter you already devised here, you get H2, and continuing you get H1 and H0. This is just like to say that we have a prototype filter, which is high pass version, this high pass version. But every time when we go further, we just do upsampling for that filter. So we are adding more zeros between, in between the uh, consecutive samples. And then we times the, we multiply that by the low pass filter and we go ahead until we get the finest res resolution that we actually need. This is how we implement this non-uniform filter bank. 
using this uh, so uh, two channels. Okay. So that's actually another view of that. So here we have a three-level multi-resolution subband coder, non-uniform uh, subband coder actually. So the entire frequency spectrum is actually divided like this. It's divided into two and then four and continuing. So every low pass version is actually divided by two. And here we do the process queue, but the same thing should happen for the complement. So for the synthesis part, you have to do everything in a mirror. So finally it looks like this. You have everything here, division by two, division by two. For every low pass you're doing division by two, but then you have to do the same thing for summation and superposition of the results until you get the entire signal in the end. And you're able actually to put your process here. Whatever process you want to do, you can put it here. Then you can be sure that at least in the representation part, so analysis of the signal and synthesis of the signal, much less information is lost because of your process. So whatever this process in between is, uh, without all the er errors that this part of the, I mean, the, the uh, core of the process will impose to the entire system, we should try in the analysis and in the synthesis to have as less possible errors as we can. So that was the idea for the filter banks in very brief and we talked about different types of the filter banks and different ways of implementing them in an efficient way. Here is the point that we can actually use the idea of the filter bank, but we can dive into the new topic which is called the wavelets. So the wavelet initially was thought to be as like as a, a filter bank. And it is actually like the filter bank, but the basis that we are talking about is quite different from the Fourier basis. So we're talking something on something uh, which primarily looks very weird, but we see that it it's actually m makes sense. And we start with the Haar filter bank, the, the first version of the filter banks, which device may be around 1910. Uh, and I don't know whether Alfred ha uh, Hart did know that time that what he's actually developing is a filter, is a wavelet or not. But today we're using it as a wavelet, Haar wavelet. So the Haar filter bank is actually using the low pass filter like this. So we have H0 low pass filter, it's just simple tap for zero and uh, minus one is actually one over uh, root square of two. And for the rest of the values are zero. And the high pass is like this. So that's a two channel separation of the spectrum using this values for the low pass and this values for the high pass. And then if you apply that to the signal, that's the result of what happens to the signal. For the high pass and for the low pass, this is what is happening to the signal as the output. So if the output y0 and y1, you will see that this would happen to the signal. So in the Haar wavelet, in the Haar filter bank, we see that the low pass filters are actually, uh, so the analysis filter and the they are, they are actually looking like this. So H0 and H1. Uh, so maybe it's better to, to see this figure. So if we go through the discrete, uh, for example, this is the, uh, the filter bank, the analysis filter bank. So we go uh, the same idea. We go for the low pass and then divide it into two. Then we take the low pass again, divide it into two, and we go ahead. And for the synthesis part, we do the same thing in the reverse order until we create the signal back. Now the point is that 
Let's look at this. What happened actually in the Har filter bank in from the from the dictionary based of view. So what we talked about the dictionaries about the basis functions and how the signal is reconstructed from the basis function or synthesized based on the basis functions. So first of all, we have to know that well we know about the orthogonality. So all all these uh, low pass and high pass filters that we talked about in our wavelets in the Haar filter bank, they are orthonormal. So it means that their energy is one unit or normal, and they are orthogonal. So the high passes and low passes, they are orthogonal. The signal construction based on the basis functions, as already we already mentioned, so it's represented like this. We have a basis function and the signal times the, uh, the inner product of the signal with this, those bases, which actually implicate that how much signal is correlated or, or is similar to that basis function times that basis function. So this is how the signal is constructed. Now we know that signal in time and in any, any linear transform domain, they have the same energy based on the Parseval theorem. If they are, if the basis functions are orthonormal, it means that the correlation of those bases is delta. So the correlation, they are orthogonal, and this is the correlation function for the two orthogonal vectors. Assuming that the bases, or those bases that we talked about in Haar filter bank are like this, as we defined. So to define two bases, two different bases, one like this and the other one like this, then the signal is actually constructed based on these two basis functions. So that's the transform which actually represents the similarity between the signal and these types of the bases and the similarity between signal and this, the other basis function. And that's the result. And then we reconstruct the signal out of that. If we look at the wavelet basis, the Haar wavelet basis, the Haar filter bank, or now we talk about the wavelet basis, they actually look like this. So we have one of the bases we define like this. And then if you change the K, so you're having a finer version or the coarser version of that basis. It's just like to compress that signal, that basis, or to stretch it. So those bases are the compressed or stretched version of one single basis. That single basis is called mother wavelet. So from the wavelet point of view, we call that mother wavelet. And actually what we do is we are actually trying to analyze the signal, for example, here, f of t, by finding the correlation of the signal with those bases, which are defined as the psi function, which we call it as the mother wavelet. And in the wavelet, in the wavelet theory or wavelet domain, we are actually dealing with two things. So we are actually in the time domain, but we are, we are having two other parameters, one for the scaling and the other one for the translation or shifting. So how we go through the signal to represent it is not taking the inner product of the signal with the Fourier basis, which actually represent the function, uh, they represent the frequency. So in the Fourier domain, we do the inner product between the signal in time and the frequency bases, which are e to the power of j omega. But here, we are having a different types of uh, bases. So we have this mother wavelet, and we get the similarity between the signal and the mother wavelet, and shifted, scaled version of those mother wavelets. 
So we have this mother wavelet, we shift it and scale it. So frequently we scale this and we shift it. Scaling means dilation, so we either compress it or we stretch it. And by compression and stretching, we are actually localizing in time. When you compress it, you're actually localizing in time. So it means that you are getting finer resolution in time. And when you stretch it, you're actually getting finer, coarser resolution in time. Indirectly, you're getting some uh, finer resolution in the frequency, but indirectly. And this B and A parameters are the scaling. So B is the shifting, or they say translation, and A is the scaling parameters. So this way we actually can tile the time frequency area, which we already explained in the Heisenberg theorem. We can tile it non-uniformly and based on our requirements such that for the lower frequencies that we need actually to get more information of the frequency part we actually allowed for the transform for the wavelet transform to have a very coarse time resolution and when we when we go further in the frequency we see that the time resolution is getting finer and finer while the frequency resolution is getting looser and looser. That's a dynamic representation of the signal over uh, time frequency. But one of the problems is that here, this mother wavelet, which looks like the, this, for the Haar wavelet actually, which looks like this. We have very different uh, mother wavelets. I can show you next time in the, I mean, uh, when we go to the MATLAB, then I can show you different other types. We see that this signal, this mother wavelet, this mother wavelet in the Fourier domain, it actually looks like this. So it's like a sync function which goes to infinity. And damping or decaying of this uh, sync function is actually uh, takes a long time. So it actually damps down smoothly. And for the, all the other cases, for all the other cases, so for this one, which is more, uh, I mean, it's less localized in time, then the frequency damps down faster. But that's a problem because it's actually going to infinity that's the problem. It creates some kind of leakage. And that's the problem. So probably we can find some better mother wavelets that have more localization in time and frequency. So here we see that we have good localization in time, but not a good localization in the frequency. For the Haar wavelet, we have good localization in time, but for the frequency, we see that it actually leaks to the other, uh, to the coming windows. So that's the definition of the continuous wavelet transform. For the discrete wavelet transform is also almost the same. And the discrete wavelet transform actually is a more efficient way. But the mother wavelet is actually something that determines the resolution of uh, the transform that we're doing. And we have different types of wavelets named based on the, the mother wavelets. So if this, if this is called the Haar mother wavelet, so that's called Haar wavelet. If you have the Mexican hat wavelet, then it's called the Mexican hat wavelet. Then we have Dubshi wavelets and so on. And for this type of transform, there, there's a condition that should be satisfied. And this condition is, first of all, that wavelet at zero should be zero. So when the filter, there's a filter in time, and it's zero, it's zero, it means that, implicitly it means that that's a bandpass filter. So it means that all the mother wavelets are bandpass filters. And the energy underneath the 
the wavelets, they should be summed up to one. So we have a symmetry between the positive part and the negative part of the, uh, all these wavelets. And these are called wavelets because uh, they are you know, small waves actually. They're like small waves. So we see that here the f basis function is actually look looking a bit weird. It's not just like the Fourier or other transform domains to have a closed form, mathematical form for the uh, actually for for the basis function. So we have um, a wavelet as the basis, and we are looking for how much signal is similar to those wavelets. Well, of course, for the um, the famous wavelets that we have, we can easily define uh, the mathematical form for the wavelets that we have. So let's see how they are implemented in a simple example. I have a question. Yes. Can you go back one slide? Sure. Uh, on the, the conditions A and tau element R, what is tau? Uh, so the shifting is, is actually meaning the scale and the shifting. So tau is shifting. So I uh, no, I replaced uh, so many times from different things. So tau is meaning here is the B actually. So it's the, uh, the scaling and the shifting, they belong to the R. So the real values, real value shifting and real value scaling of the mother wavelet. Okay? And they sum up to zero. So the energy of the positive and negative sides should be zero. That's the, this, um, uh, you know, the, um, the underneath, so the, in, the underneath the, the curve, we are actually summing up to zero. And also it's uh, the, the third one, which implicates that uh, the mother wavelet at zero should be uh, zero, because otherwise, this value actually will not converge. Okay. So here we see that the signal xt is actually is not running. It's playing, I think. So the signal x of t is actually correlated with the mother wavelets. And we have actually the three-dimensional signal based on the scaling, shifting, and the value that it actually comes out as a third dimension. So it's interesting that I cannot see, but you can see that. Uh, let me run in again. So you see that the first, for the first case, maybe when it finished, I will play it again. So, so you have the signal and you have this mother wavelets with different localizations in time. So first, for example, you can start with the very local in time. You can translate this wavelet over the entire signal. You get all the information. You keep this information and then forget about the rest. You go for the next wavelet, which is the scaled version. So in the scaling, we are actually ma making more course in time, but it means that more information frequency. And then we translate over the signal, move over the signal, get the information, and then we continue up to the any states that we need to get the information out of the signal. And uh, it turns out that the implementation of wavelet actually is even much faster than FFT. If FFT is in log uh, n log n, the order of the FFT is n log n, for wavelet is actually linear, it's just n. So it means that maybe the trend of future signal analysis goes to the wavelets than the Fourier transforms. And it's actually getting more prevalent in many areas. People try to actually use the wavelet transforms instead of Fourier transforms. And even they could get a very much better results. For example, I saw a paper and they were using um, 
they were testing actually MFCC features with to try actually to get it out with the Fourier transform and the same idea taken with the uh, wavelets and the results with wavelets are quite much better than the MFCC version so the analysis using the MFCC and the wavelets so wavelets are very interesting and very important tools and in the future if you were about to do something in the um, signal processing and you were about to analyze the signal <coughs> it should be one of your options to choose the wavelets at the signal decomposition as a signal decomposition and it's very fast we have the, uh, the same ideas for the image signal so not only for this one-dimensional signal like speech but also for the case of two-dimensional signal you have you can actually apply the same idea for the filter banger wavelet so for example considering you have an image you have rows and columns you go for one row for example you do the filtering low pass and high pass and you get the information so doesn't work okay so you go for the low pass and the high pass and you get the information the so um, for the low pass again you can do the low pass and the high pass and for the high pass version again you can do the low pass and the high pass division Now, what you get is actually the low pass, low pass. So the, the low pass version of the low pass version of the signal is actually giving you the approximation of the signal. And the rest, they are all details. So you have, always you have one approximation and the rest are the details of the signal. So if you have the signal here, which is an image, the signal is an image. Then if you go for a filter bank, or a wavelet we'll see later what you're doing is actually you make the low pass and the high pass division so you get the information in the low pass and the high pass then you make another division for the low pass and the high pass and what you get is actually this information the low pass low pass is the approximation of the signal then the high pass of the low pass is the horizontal version then the low pass of the high pass is the vertical and the high pass of the high pass is nothing but the diagonal. Okay? This is how they are in interpreted in the image analysis. So with the synthesis part, again, you have to do the same thing back. So the reverse order, so you have the diagonal, vertical, horizontal, and approximation, and you have to use the same idea that we had in the filter bank to reconstruct the signal back into the original state as an example we have for example here an image the boat image if you do the wavelet transform then we're here in three levels it's been applied in three levels the previous filter bank structure was in two level but if you do it in three level that will come up to this one so for the two level let's see it in two level we will see later in the uh, MATLAB example. So the low pass of the low pass of the low pass, so the, the series of the low passes finally come up with the approximation. So you see that this is almost an approximation of the signal you have here. But the rest, so based on the low pass of the high pass or high pass of the low pass or high pass of the high pass, so all the high passes, when they are lined up, that will come up with this diagonal term and the rest for the vertical and the horizontal. So the horizontal parts and the vertical parts. These are the details, but the approximation is just this one. So you have always the approximation of the signal, squeezed version of the signal, and you have the details. Now it turns out that many of those information in the detail part, not the approximation, the detail part, Many of those information might be non-informative. 
If they are not informative, you can ignore those parts. You can selectively ignore those parts based on the image, based on the features that you can extract from the images, or you can just ignore one level. For example, you can ignore all these parts. You say that, okay, I don't need all these parts. Because normally noises are high frequency or details of the images, if you ignore from some level of details onward, you're actually somehow you are in uh, it's just like you know indirectly you're filtering the image and you're getting rid of the noise using uh, the wavelet transform so here you see that we have for example noise it looks like a salt and pepper noise and this is the original image we have but by using the hard thresholding so the denoising the image using uh, so hard thresholding means here that from one level onwards you ignore the details and by doing that you're actually ignoring the noise you're extracting the noise out of the signal and you see that this enhanced version of the image which is almost the same as this one will al always lose something some information but uh, at least they are pretty much closer than the previous version so that was all i had to say something which is uh, compatible with the level of the course about the filter banks time frequency transforms and the wavelets so you can go further and uh, if you're interested and if your background, mathematical background and signal processing background is already developed, then you can go to the literature to find more details, how to implement them and how to use them for different applications. But just to give you a flavor of what we can do with the wavelets, let's have a look at the wavelet toolbox from the MATLAB. So if you could just type the wavelet here in the help menu, in the help uh, bar actually, the edit box, then you have uh, different information and one of them is the wavelet toolbox. Uh, well, there are many things in case of even the theoretical stuff you can find in MATLAB. So even for example, if you want to know about uh, some more sophisticated theory theories about the wavelets, uh, for example, here, wavelet packet. So you just go to the wavelet packet analysis in help of the MATLAB. And then even you can find the concepts explained here in most cases very efficiently. And you can actually get the lead uh, of the entire idea what is around the wavelet packet. So you can even use MATLAB help menus like a book, like a theory. Uh, or the tutorial and you can use that for even for the examples so here for example is it concept and then you can go to the concept about the wavelet packet what is wavelet packet analysis and explains in details so wavelet packet is the same as the wavelet the only difference is that not only the details but also uh, so not we have the low pass and high pass and the structure we saw we just uh, divide the low pass part into again you know the divisions but if you do the same thing for the high pass part again then you have uh, this symmetric tree pattern which finally is called the wavelet packet and you can do more with the wavelet packet um, but uh, the details of information are here and i didn't went through that and you can actually get so many nice examples even in the MATLAB help box so never forget to start your um, you know studying and the ideas or at least put MATLAB wave uh, MATLAB um, help menu as one of your references if you want to study something maybe sometimes it gives you more clear examples and you will learn it much faster so uh, I wanted to talk about the wavelet toolbox 
so we can have wavelets and filter banks um, let me see So we have um, continuous wavelet transforming. There, there are so many applications. So you see here, there are so many applications. And let's start with, with the image, maybe. So here you see. Uh, there is an image so um, you can here set the wavelets but let me see why it is frozen we have the wave menu so let's start from here for the uh, wavelets there is a dedicated toolbox it's called wave menu so uh, you can you can have one dimensional signals you can have two dimensional signals even three dimensional signals and so on uh, one dimensional for example everything like um, the speech signal so you can easily load your signal one signal uh, we can take it actually from maybe from database so this is an a typical clean speech signal so uh, you can analyze this for example with anything hard wavelet wavelets wavelet uh, uh, quifflet or this one was uh, I don't remember by orthogonal wavelets and so on so the hard wavelet five level how many levels you want it depends on you but if you analyze that then you will get the signal for different levels so here you see that uh, we have for example this is the signal s then you have uh, a5 and then you have the rest as d these are details and a is the approximation so here you see that this is the approximation of the signal and you see that it's almost the same as the signal it's almost the same as the signal the amplitude is uh, much less than the, the signal itself but then you have the details of the signal in different levels so d1 d2 d3 d4 d5 these are the details of the signal so let's see the histogram okay maybe well the signal I know that is not uh, noisy but if we do the denoising then probably uh, let's see what happens but it shouldn't be something much different because the signal was clean so uh, apparently if we do the denoising nothing comes out of that but you can do the denoising just the same idea that we talked about maybe if I go to the images then uh, it's more uh, representative because uh, we actually see what happens on the image so let's load the image um, the Lena image where did I put the Lena image It was in one of the lectures, I think we talked about that, huh? Or maybe I can go to Internet. And this one is the immersion. desktop yes 
So if we load the, the image, then we can have different representations using the hard wavelet, for example. And if just we do the two level as we had in the uh, slides, that's what we get. So that's the approximation of the signal, which looks quite the same as the signal itself. And these are the details of the signal uh, in vertical, horizontal, and the diagonal term. So the high pass version is in the diagonal, and then you have the low pass of the high pass, high pass of the low pass, and so on. And you can have even more, but this uh, approximation should also uh, always preserve the um, most informative part of the signal. And this is if you do the inverse uh, discrete wavelet transform, then the signal which is actually reconstructed is this one. And ideally, this re uh, reconstructed version should be quite the same as the original signal. It should be the same. But then, if you have noise, for example, you can add some noise to the images, and then you can do the denoising, for example. So, it went to somewhere different, denoise the signal. Well, the signal was already clean, so the denoising in the original version is not that much different. But we can load some image which is actually uh, together with noise, and then we can do any any types of that. Uh, so let's let's see if we, we change it, for example, from hard to Dabashi, the same level. So the analysis will be different. And you see that it looks that the, synth uh, the synthesized version is a bit clear, more clear than the hard wavelet. So. And also for these details, I don't know whether you can see it or not, but the details are much more than what it was in the hard wavelet. And uh, we have the bi-orthogonal wavelets, they are also very interesting. And yeah, even here we can see the details even more. The bi-orthogonal case, so the details are even more. So different types of the wavelets. But we don't go through the differences in the wavelets themselves. We know that they actually um, employ different mother wavelets. And they do the same thing, a scaling and shifting or translation. And then applying to the signal, you will get out the information for the approximation and the details. And then if you ignore some details, you will actually denoise the signal. There are many other applications that they use wavelets, like watermarking and so on. Yes, please. when you are saying two levels, three levels, whatever you say, you're actually manually changing the scale. So you say the two levels, it means that you're compressing two times. Oh, okay. So when it, that's why wavelets are also used for the compression. So when you say, or even I want to say that JPEG 2000. So JPEG and the JPEG 2000 are two different versions of the same um, the, 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 so image compression. So we already, uh, so you know that for the image, the original image that you uh, acquire is bitmap, BMP. Then you do the compression, because bitmap is normally, uh, the size of the bitmap file is too huge. So what people used to do was using the JPEG, and it was using the KL transform, or the PCA, in order to do the compression, lossy compression. As I explained, the PCA can do a lossy compression. but. Uh, so around 2000, that was the wavelet that came up. And people, instead of using PCA, they used the wavelets. And the JPEG 2000 version, I can show you even how much, you know, it was a kind of revolution in the image processing because uh, people actually could get a very high resolution images with m even more compressed version of the signal. So, uh, let's see if I can find something a representative, something that shows uh, maybe the first one. Yeah, so 
Here you see that this JPEG, which belongs to uh, the PCA, so it, it actually employs the PCA, and this one uh, actually employs uh, the wavelet. And you see that it's, you know, because uh, the PCA method, the, the one that works based on the PCA, is actually uses the block-based methods. You see that uh, there are small blocks uh, you can see in the picture. If, if I, you know, uh, zoom the picture, you can uh, even see those blocks. But for the wavelet, it's more smooth, more soft, softer than this one, and uh, the resolution is much higher. So uh, let's go to this. Maybe I can. It's now I think more representative. 